next group. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks again for coming. Um, uh, it's my uh, privilege to uh, introduce uh, John and Tyler to talk about the isometric testing station. Um, I've had the uh, opportunity to have both these guys in class for uh, four times. Uh, so, uh, so it's really neat to kind of see their progress. And uh, I was very impressed with their ability to work through the design process, their resilience in uh, overcoming obstacles. And I think you guys would be impressed with their, uh, their design as well. That's it. Um, like she said, uh, my name is Sean Bonchbach. This is John Sala. And today we're going to talk to you about our senior design project, which was the isometric testing station. Okay, so our presentation is broken down into different parts here. So in doing background research and talking with our clients at the beginning of the semester, 
we narrowed our project down to these seven functional requirements. Number one is to quantify that applied force. Number two is to accommodate the range of motion of each of those four aforementioned joints. We need a limb length adjustment. So for example, Tyler and I have different length arms and legs, so it needs to adapt to those two measures. We need a vertical adjustment. The clients have asked us to <coughs> create a station that can adapt to anyone from a four foot middle school student all the way up to a seven foot basketball player. Um, we need to resist the applied loading. As seen here, we're set at 500 foot pounds, and that number comes from the specifications of that HUMAC norm seen earlier in the presentation. We need to be able to accommodate standing, sitting, and lying down operation, and then additionally, it needs to be portable. And that last requirement is very important. Our clients have asked <coughs> for a device that they can take to different functions here on USI's campus, and also uh, other uh, you know, high school events and other events in the area. So the first functional requirement here is to capture that applied loading. Todd and I felt that this was very important, uh, a pivotal thing to overcome early in the design process. So we purchased this 1,000 pound universal uniaxial load cell. We're using it in compression because we realized that that was the best way to capture 100% of that applied loading. <coughs> Similar to the bicep exercise earlier on, force is in the up direction, resistance is in the downward direction. Here's the software that came with the device here. Um, Works very similar to your weight scale at home. Uh, when we took this screenshot here, 10.1 pounds of loading was a live measurement. Very intuitive, very plug and play capabilities. This is a schematic showing where the load cell is at on our device. So looking over here, uh, the left side shows a front view, mirror orientation, and the right side is the rear view. So as you can see, the load cell is right here on our uh, prototype. So the second functional requirement was the ability to sweep out that range of motion. So what we did, we attached our load cell and a fixture to a swing arm, which is a, a piece of rectangular tubing. And we attached that swing arm to a pivot point, which is actually just a shaft going into the board here. So that swing arm would be able to rotate in a semicircular motion around the pivot point. So in operation, you would put your elbow at the pivot point, put your wrist underneath the load cell, Apply a load in position one, record your, <coughs> record your measurement, move the swing arm to position two, apply the load, record your measurement, so on and so forth. Once again, back to that diagram, showing you where the swing arm is at, and it's right um, Ty's going to go ahead and talk to you about the limb length adjustment now. All right, thanks, John. Okay, so at this moment right now, we went through and we decided that, you know, to capture a load, we're going to use the load stop. But if I go to apply a force on this, or I'm sorry, we're doing the limb length adjustment. I'm jumping ahead here. Um, for the limb length adjustment, okay, so right now I have a load cell on my fixture, which is fixed to the end of the swing arm. Well, this swing arm is, say, 18 inches long. Now, that 18 inches, that only accommodate a few exercises for a few people. That doesn't achieve all the different exercises for, say, a child up to an adult. So how are we going to accommodate all of those different um, distances? Well, to do that, we took the fixture, we made it more of a sleeve, and we put it over the over top of the uh, swing arm, and we have holes tapped in it. It's where we can just pin it, move it, and then again, we have a quick video to demonstrate exactly how that would work. You see I remove the pin, take it to a new location, repin it, and it tends to be replaced every year. And this um, diagram is just showing you where the load cell fixture is. Um, to my left here, it's on the end, and again, you can move up and down. Okay, so now let's talk about the resisting the applied loading. This is what I was about to talk about a minute ago. Um, so we're applying a force to the end of this load cell. Well, what's going to happen if I apply a force? Naturally, that swing arm is going to want to move up. We need that left hand in there to prevent that from happening. So this is our left hand, the mechanical ratchet clutch. And it's just like any ratchet clutch that you guys own. Um, it has three settings, a right lock, a left lock, and a full lock. You'd use the right lock and the left lock to adjust the swing arm where you need it. And then you put it in the full lock state to apply a load. And we provided the hand loop on there to give you more of a control over the position of the swing arm. So from your uh, perspective, the ratchet clutch is on the back side here. You might be able to see it, I don't know, but it's on the back side and it's, the shaft is running through it. Okay, so now let's talk about the vertical adjustment portion of this. So we've achieved all the limb length adjustments, but now we need to achieve the height adjustment. So say I'm gonna go from my shoulder to my elbow to my hip to my knee, how are we gonna do that? Well, we need the load cell, its fixture, the swing arm, the shaft, the ratchet clutch and the hand wheel to be able to move up and down. So we put those all in an assembly, put it, it almost identical to the, um, the uh, 
the swing arm fixture or the load cell fixture use the same type of clock, it's just linear motion. And we drill holes in it and we have a post for it to traverse up and down and we can pin it every inch. And here's a quick video to show exactly how that would work. As you can see, it's best to use the player. Make sure you remove the pins. Lift it up. Place the pins. Pin it to your it for a minute. And there you go. And um, the post is the tall portion of the design. And the post sleeve is what's around it. Okay, so now, before we really get into this, I want to talk to you about the platform. Because I'm just introducing this platform, and I'm not really telling you where it came from. Basically, when we go to apply a force on the end of this load cell, right now we have something preventing the rotation of that swing arm. We don't have anything that's going to prevent the movement of that post up and down. So we decided, let's just pin the post to a platform. We'll have the user stand on the platform. So when they go to apply a force, their weight is counteracting that, that force they're applying. So what's, how big is this thing going to be? Well, um, this goes to our functional requirement, the standing, the sitting, and the lying down. Standing, it's kind of a small footprint. Seat, sitting down is also kind of a small footprint. But lying down is kind of was the full major player here. So we need to um, base this off of a typical recreational bench, which is roughly 48 inches across from one support to the next. So we made the device 50 inches wide, or, I'm sorry, five feet wide. And then for the depth of it, um, as for our clients, we needed 36 inches of usable space from the front side of the post to the end. So that's where that depth came from. And this is where the platform is. Now let's talk about the portability. Like John said, this is kind of important um, so they can move this device around. Well, this thing is huge, right? It's not going through a door the way it is right now. So we decided, what, what are we going to do? Let's just cut it in half. So we cut it in half, we put caches on, all four, on, on both sections. And here's a video of how it would work. So first I'm going to disengage the post with the pin from the platform. Now I'm going to lift it up, place it on the front half of the platform. It takes a quick few seconds. Now we're going to disengage the front half of the platform from the rear half with two pins. John's going to take his half, now I'm going to take mine. And as you can see, we traverse through the door without any problem at all. Alright, um, this is, so yeah, this, this is what we did. We used uh, just basically catchers. We have four catchers on each half. Um, on the operator side, you have swivel catchers. That way you've got a little more control. And the opposite side, you have frigid catchers. So here's the final design. This was made using Dassault Systems SolidWorks, um, one of their rendering tools. As you can see, this is everything in context. So we've got the swing arm with the low cell the fixture, the post sleeve, the post, the platform, and the caster. All right, so now I'm going to pass it over to John. He's going to talk about some of the more exciting stuff, the design analysis. All right, so after we had our final design, we had it all drawn up in CAD. We wanted to make sure that it was able to withstand that applied loading. So using finite element analysis and hand calculations and Excel spreadsheets, we simulated the worst case scenario loading, or that 500 foot pounds mentioned earlier in the presentation. Critical results that we were interested in were the maximum stress, deflection of the members, and the factory safety. We used these results to optimize the material and dimensions of all of our components. Here's a back to that diagram again. It has a call out for each of the components undergoing loading with their corresponding factors of safety. As you can see here, all the factors of safety are above one. Anything below one would indicate failure. We kind of hovered around a factor of safety of 1.5 as much as possible to Make sure that we are structurally sound while minimizing the weight and cost. So after we were happy with all of our material and dimensions of all the components seen here, the next process was to take it over to the AEC, the Applied Engineering Center on the USS campus here, and utilize a lot of their state-of-the-art machinery over there. Um, using the uh, horizontal bandsaw, we cut down our square tubing to length. We used a Bridgeport mill and a triaxial displacement sensor for precision drilling of our holes and the slot in our post. And then we use metal and air gas welding to weld all the metal together. And here's a picture of Tyler welding the base together. And here's our final design. Post operative strength tester, acronym POST, with all the components called out. And this is the same thing you see up here. It's just that this was before we painted it. So after we had our final prototype here, we wanted to test it and make sure that it was actually capable of all the different exercises required. So here's four pictures of us, one at each joint, the knee, shoulder, hip, and elbow. And we concluded that it was adaptable to all the required exercises. Now Tyler's going to go ahead and talk to you about the cost of our prototype versus the cost of the state-of-the-art machinery. All right. So 
if you remember way back at the beginning of the presentation, we mentioned something called a DMAC doll, right? It was this great device that did isometric, isotonic, and um, isokinetic. But the price of it was roughly $45,000. So that's a little bit out of the budget. That's why they reached out to us to make something a little cheaper. And they didn't want isotonic or isokinetic at this time. They just wanted isometric. So this is what we were able to provide, a, a device that does just isometric for less than $2,500. Um, before we do our demonstration, I have some acknowledgments. Uh, first and foremost, USI's um, engineering department for all support during our entire um, undergraduate experience. Uh, Dr. Natasha Smith, she's been both John and I's advisor throughout not just this course, but throughout the course of our uh, undergraduate career. Dr. Jason Langley and Mr. Dave Insler, they provided us the project scope and also they were great throughout the design process. Um, USI's kinesiology support department, the other reason we have something here right now, they forked over the cash to build this. Uh, Justin Amos, for um, his extensive machining knowledge and also patience putting up with John and I over here. Kind of a side note here for any undergraduate students in here, I highly, highly encourage you to make your way over to the AEC, introduce yourself to Justin, and have some fun. Because John and I, we kind of kick ourselves a little bit for only having this semester for the AEC. Um, also, Adam Go Bioenergy, which is where John works, they donated several components. They helped us with the design phase. Um, Bo Venti, my boss, I believe he's here right now, but with the West Tech building products, he allowed me to take off work like that at a moment's notice. Then finally, my girlfriend, Brittany Smith, for dealing with all the long hours I was working on this. All right, so now we're going to conclude with a little demonstration to show you exactly how this works. I worked out today, so I'm looking at the numbers. I'm a little tired. All right, so first, I'm going to kind of get this set up for my knees. So I lined it up, as you can see my elbows can be lined on um, the joint here, and my wrist is roughly on the load pad. It should be noted that these numbers are negative because we're using the load cell compression. All right, so I'm gonna apply a force. What's the number on the left? <laughs> What's his load? So in the bottom right, you can see my max, my peak load was 77.4 oh, pounds. I bet if you ask our clients, they would say he's using his uh, his body right now to produce this. But again, so you repeat, you repeat this process from extension to full contraction, and this is going to look bad. Uh, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> so that kind of concludes our presentation. Do you have any questions? Questions. <clears throat> Uh, how, how difficult would it be to implement the other two, you know, the isokinetics and the, remember? Um, yeah, so I think for the most part we have a device that, if you remember the ratchet clutch, this is what we mentioned earlier on, I think that device could be the only thing they replace with something else that would achieve that isokinetic and so on and so forth. Because everything else, Everything else kind of meets the other functional requirements. That's just one functional requirement. So we think replace that, pop something in there that would achieve that. Okay. Thor, if you wanted to do an exercise, say, where you were moving like your foot down, would you flip your load cell upside down or could you just use it in compression or tension or would it matter? Right, so yeah, this would come off. Hopefully I don't screw your thing up by doing this. Why? Well, it would come off flip. Is that what you're asking? Right. I didn't know if it mattered if you used it. Yeah, I mean, well, it's got a load button on the top and the bottom, so technically, right now, we only have this load pad on the bottom side of it, but you could put the load pad on the opposite side and apply the load there as well. What are the extra connections there on? <coughs> oh, right, so if you recall, we're going to put a bench on this, and we thought it'd be a good idea to have a couple other slots for the post if their joints weren't lining up. So when you have a bench on here, if you lay down, your shoulder is going to be over in this area. That would allow them to adapt to those other exercises. Answer your question. Other questions? Does it have any relevance whatsoever if the load cell is closer to the pivot point or farther out? Does leverage on the actual arm have anything to do with the force, or is it just strictly in the load cell? It's just strictly in the load cell. The only thing that's going to change is the torque, because now you have along your moment arm here. So basically you're gonna to multiply that force by this moment arm. So as this load cell gets closer to the pivot point, you're gonna produce less of the force, or less of the force, I'm sorry. Yes. Anybody else? Other questions? All right.
Let's give them a hand.